What I want to talk about today is the developing athlete, the junior athlete, um, and basically for young people who are getting into this sport and trying to make a career out of being a footballer, netballer, basketballer, whoever you're working with, but also try and give a little bit of insight into my trip or my journey from, um, from when I started to now and the lessons I've learned along the way, which now basically have uh, developed my philosophy on the junior athlete and how I want them trained and, and, and how I think they should be trained. Um, started out, did my Bachelor of Sports Science, went down the path of Masters of Strength and Conditioning at ECU. It uh, was one of the early intakes to go through that, but now it's, it seems to be every second person has that Masters. Um, has a lot of great things about it, uh, as to education, but by no means now I see resumes coming along and, and most people have it, so it's not a, not a path to get to a job, it's just a path to, to further your education. From there, I was, I was fortunate enough to have three seasons at Geelong Football Club. Um, started as an intern in 2006, just sweeping the gym and putting the weights away, and sort of was, was fortunate enough to be involved over those next three years as, a, as an employee. And I think that's what shaped my role and what led to my next job at the Queensland Reds, because I was involved in a successful club and a successful culture, not through any real doing of my own. I was just lucky to be there by association and get a little bit of success and um, be a part of that program. And that's what allowed me to then get my next job uh, and progress on my career. So for those of you who are in looking for roles, looking for positions, if you can attach a cart to a successful coach or a successful team and be involved with that person as they got the ranks as well, that's, that's a great way to get your next position. Because there's so many people who are coming out with the same qualifications and the same experience, but if you can be involved with success or associated with success, it does help you and help you on your path. I then moved to Queensland Reds. <coughs> I had two years at the Queensland Reds in the Australian Rugby Union. We were lucky enough to win a Super Rugby title there with the Queensland Reds in 2011. Which Then I went to Toyota Shockey Rugby in Japan, had two seasons there. Back to Queensland Reds in 2014, 15 seasons. We're coming from a very successful era of, of Queensland Rugby in 2010, 2012. Back in 2014, 15, where Queensland Rugby wasn't faring so well, um, and that had the, the problems associated with that. But I was fortunate enough to have the head of rehab, head of strength, and then a bit of an interim head of performance role there at Queensland Rugby. So I was fortunate enough to get those roles and really enjoyed my time there. Um, however, it didn't go as planned. We weren't winning games, so it sort of made my path not as easy to follow moved back down this way, got a, a role at Geelong Grammar, and then that's where I am now, I've been there nearly two years. Um, so we've got a great team working with me down there. Um, I had a couple of mentors on the way. So at, at Geelong I had Dean Robinson, uh, who was at Geelong, went to Gold Coast, ended up at Essendon. Um, I think it's really important that every coach you have, uh, every coach you have, you're trying to learn something from. So everyone should be adding something to you as a coach, you as a person, and your program. So the people who are working with myself at Geelong Grammar, I say take the things that you like that I do, things that you don't like what I do, find somebody else that does it better, and add that to your program. But everyone you get involved with, you should be taking something from their program. He was innovative, and he basically taught me that if you give players good advice, they'll come back and ask you for advice again. So Dean Robinson, it, it, who's a bloke who I, um, I can't speak highly enough, but upon first impressions, he's not somebody who you're warm to straight away. Okay, in that football environment, it's a tough place to be in. But he was kept asking questions by blokes like Matty Scarlett, Joel Corey, Corey Enright, those sort of players who were, who were no-nonsense players. And every time he gave them advice, it was good advice. It made them better. And it really highlighted that that is our role as coaches, especially working junior athletes or senior athletes, is players are trusting us to give them good advice that makes them better which then makes them get more game time, more kicks, play a better role, get a better contract, get a longer career. Basically, really, they're trusting us as coaches a great deal. And Dino was, uh, he was excellent in giving good advice. And he said, every program you write, you're asking your athletes to commit three to six weeks of their career in that program. So you've got to make sure it's a good program, it's right for that player. It's not just something you've whipped up off the cuff. Um, and something I use greatly now is, is fight the 10% and give the 1%. So there's going to be times as coaches, um, when you're dealing with coaches outside media commitments, whoever you may be dealing with, you try and give little wins. If it's not really going to affect the outcome of your program, give the one percenters. Give the other peop people a win so that when you feel something, when you feel strongly about something, if it's a 10 percenter, if you think it's going to affect the outcome of your athlete, your training program, that's when you want to take that win, you want to get that back. 
But if you're constantly fighting all the little battles, the other person just feels like they're giving all the time. And, and no one likes losing. And if you're always winning the argument, even if it's something petty and minimal, it's not gonna affect your program, they soon get sick of it and they'll, they'll arc up at some stage when you, want, when you really need the win. So fight the 10 percenters, let the 1 percenters slide. Hainsey, who was also, Paul Haynes was also at Geelong Football Club. We had two heads of strength and conditioning, Dino from the strength and Hainsey from the conditioning. Now, and they were two different characters as well. Paul was extremely good work ethic and he had a passion for the job and he really instilled that passion in his athletes and the people around him. His enthusiasm got people up. If there was a day where the intensity wasn't great or where players were struggling a little bit, Paul was the guy who really lifted it and really brought that passion and got that enthusiasm and got around the group and got them up and about. Okay, and, and that's how you know how your team's going. You can do all the RPEs or you can do all the monitoring sleep quality and, and looking at how your player's going, but just getting in, having a chat, how are they today? Are they up and about? Are they running around? Are they behaving like teenage boys? That's probably a good thing. It means they're up and about, they're feeling good. If they're quiet and they're low, and it's, that sort of gives you a fair indication of where they're at as a group. Um, yep, yeah, next one over. And Damien Marsh, 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 he was at Queensland Reds. Uh, and I think my first three years at Geelong, at Geelong Footy Club, I was pretty raw, straight out of uni, didn't have a great deal of knowledge about how things should be. So I was really heavily relying on Dino and Hainsey. Um, and my role predominantly was just doing what I was, what was asked of me. Okay, helping set up, clean up, taking players through, through set um, routines and, and structures or rehab programs, but I didn't actually do a lot of programming and going out of my own a great deal. When I got to Marshy, a couple of things he instilled. He instilled in a very young group that went on to win the title in 2011. Yep, 2011. Um, excellence is a habit. He, he was very strict on what we do and everything we do, we do well. So if we were doing a, a running test, if the line was here, you had to go over the line. Touch the line, you're out, okay? Because it's that 1%, it might even only be one centimetre. In rugby union or league, if you're one inch offside, that's still offside. It's a penalty. Rugby union, that could be three points. So it's a difference between touching a line or going over the line. And he instilled that in a very young group that was very vulnerable and susceptible to being led at the time. And he really instilled that work ethic and that the belief that everything they do has to be excellent. And he, he delivered a very simple program. It was a simple program delivered well, and that's what most of my chat today is going to be about, is how our program should be, how I deliver my programs. But most of that's coming off Damien Marsh. Had the respect of his players and his peers, very similar to the other coaches. The players believed they asked him a question, he made them better because he gave them the right answer. And I think once you, if you keep doing that, the players will continue to ask you questions, and you can shape and mould that player how you want. You can almost lead them to the path down the the player you want them to be by giving them knowledge that makes them better and then they trust your opinion. Um, and he practiced what he preached. He was always uh, working hard. So I'll get on now to more towards the Geelong Grammar. Um, for those of you who don't know about much about Geelong Grammar, is we've got, so I've got four staff there who I work predominantly with. We've got Todd Finn, Jake Pro Crosby, Kieran Lester and James Westhorpe. Okay, they're our four staff members who are leading more towards the strength and conditioning type of role. Um, and they're great because we've got young up and coming coaches who are keeping up to date with everything that's coming along. And they're also showing that on to me and saying, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? So I think one thing as a coach is you've got to make sure that you don't get set in your ways. It's good to have your philosophy and your training overview, but then you still have to be open to new things coming in. And having four young coaches who I work with closely, it allows them to bring in ideas and add things to the program that sometimes I've taken out of my programming for no particular reason just never come back in. But we have, <coughs> we're a boarding school, approximately 800 boarding students. Uh, we have an elite facility. We've got a, a 10 lane swimming pool, diving pool, basketball courts, our gym's fantastic. Um, and we've been utilized by Melbourne Storm for the last three pre-seasons, last three years. I've done a two week camp there. Uh, we had St Kilda this year. So we're getting that we're getting those elite teams coming using our facilities because they can stay on campus, we can feed them, they can do their education, their rehab, their recovery, and their, their weights and their, and their training at our facility. So we're very fortunate to have them come in. We're open to students before school, lunchtime and after school. So 6 to 7.30, 12.30 to 
uh, and 3.30 to 6. Rowing is our predominant sport and in 2018 we had four AFL draftees. Jared Brander, he's one of them there. He's, I actually saw this photo and he's, uh, he looks pretty skinny there. But he's um, had his first game for West Coast about two weeks ago, so he's, uh, he's going well. But what I think we've got to do is, is looking back to obviously what Dan was saying with the ACL stuff, one of the most important things with our programming is we want to prevent them getting the situation where they've done an ACL. Okay, so we've got to look at, that's probably the most important aspect and role of what we're going to be doing, is getting them, avoiding them being out of the sport for you know, nine or 12 months. And if you do, if they ask, we always just say 12 months to a, to a young kid or a young uh, player. But you say nine months, and same to coaches. Coach asks, how long are they out for? Give them worst case scenario, give them, tell them 12 months. You get them back in nine months, you're a superstar. But if you tell them nine months and you're back in 12, then you're, um, you're fighting a battle for three months with the coach, that coach asking you, why aren't they back every, every week? But I think we've got to look at, with a junior athlete, we've got to understand the requirements of the athlete you're coaching. Okay, so most of us working predominantly here in football, um, understand what are the requirements that your athlete needs to do to be able to partake his, his sport on a sad day. Okay, one, what they need to be able to do, what are our limiting physical factors? That's pretty simple. We'll see that in a, a coaching environment. We'll go on to do that more. But also what are limiting mental factors or the situational and lifestyle factors? So those factors we have are they're a boarding school student, they're away from home. Um, we do get very good access to them because they live on campus. They can come over before school and they can go through their training sessions. So we have approximately 10 scholars, AFL scholars at our school now. Um, so we have Damien Shanahan has done an excellent job going out there and finding us very good athletes who want to come and sell him Long Grammar School as an education venue and also as a physical performance venue where we can develop those athletes and send them on to be the best they can, hopefully have a long career. So Damien Shanahan looks after our scholar projects and we have netballers, soccer um, and some athletics, uh, athletics scholars as well. Um, then also, I think you've got to ask, every time you write a program, what are you trying to achieve with your programs and are your programs achieving this? So the second question is good. First of all, you have to have a direction where you want your programs to go, but secondly, is the outcome, are you getting that outcome from your programs? Um, and what am I trying to achieve? I think with the athletes we've got here, coming back to what Damien Marsh was saying, I think strength and the strength component of strength and conditioning or of, of developing athletes, it's a very simple process. Okay, I think we get caught up in overcomplicating it, but at the heart of it, the actual strength program is very simple. The complexity comes in when we, how we integrate that into a whole training program. So what are your time constraints? What's your situational factors? How often do you have access to your athletes? That's where it becomes complex. But I think writing the actual strength programs, and I'll give you a um, I look at what we do in a minute, but it's a very, very simple process. So I just can't get caught up in what we're seeing elsewhere, what other coaches are doing, what's getting put out by the elite facilities around the world. That's great, they're dealing with elite athletes. What we're dealing with is the adolescent athlete who we just want to be able to basically control their limbs. Okay, so we've got some of our younger athletes are getting taller real quick, so they get that real burst of their, their limb length lengthens, their bone structure lengthens, but does the musculature have time to really adapt and can it keep up with that extra limb length? So if they're getting longer limbs, it's harder, they need to be stronger to be able to control that. It, so what we're trying to do is send athletes to the next stage of their career with an understanding of strength and conditioning principles. We want them to have a fair buy-in of their programs. So I reckon athletes who understand the why get more out of their training. It's gotta be intrinsic rather than the extrinsic motivation. Okay, and looking at how, especially now going back to a school age setting, 16, 17 year old, I'll say boys particularly, they know a lot. They're pretty, you're pretty smart at 16 and 17. There's so much stuff out there on YouTube or on Twitter or, or any social media. They'll see a program done by somebody overseas and they'll bring that into you and they'll say, this is the best, this is what I'm gonna be doing. In my setting, I see that a lot. So what we're trying to do then is educate them on the paths of what, what our philosophies are at grammar. And then so that they can, if they believe what we're telling them, if they have a fair understanding, a fair buy-in, we find that we're getting better results from our athletes. Um, and it's a team sport. I want them to integrate in the program ASAP. So for instance, Paddy Dow is our top pick this year. He went pick three to Carlton. 
the way I see a, a rookie athlete coming into an AFL system, or the way I want people coming out of our program, is coming in and being able to have their week or two when they first come in with the, the development coach or whoever's looking after the, um, the young rookies. They might go through the weights programs, they'll do a, an FMS screening, um, and they'll say, okay, this guy's pretty good. He can then start joining in with a senior group as quick as they can. Because pre-Christmas, you might get the guys for four or five weeks, pre-Christmas in the AFL program. If you can get that young rookie at 18 integrating into the, the group as quickly as they can, maybe pre-Christmas they might get to run in a four pocket in a little bit of match sim, something along those lines. They start integrating, kick a good goal. All of a sudden they're a part of that main group, part of the banner, part of the boys. So they're then at a greater head start post-Christmas when they come back and then they might get a chance to be involved in a, a pre-season cup game or, or be involved that way. But I think if we can get our athletes, our junior athletes, to be ro rocking up to an AFL club, in pretty good shape, they're going to mould them how they want them. We just want to get them involved and integrate as quickly as they can to be part of that culture and that, the way they move through it. So my job is to provide the foundation for future coaches to build upon. As stated, 90% of my programs look the same across all sports. We're going to have a compound leg exercise, superset with a jump and land. Now how they get that compound leg, I'm not too fast. Um, we've got the trap bar deadlifts, which I think have been a good, good inclusion. Um, and we've got low handles, high handles, etc. So we can we can work with our tall athletes to have the higher handles. But I like the I like the deadlift because the bar comes off the ground. You're getting that same amount of range, same amount of motion all the time. It's pretty much a very similar movement. Squatting you can go sh shallower, deeper, etc. But a deadlift, it's it's pretty. Um, so it's probably reliable or it's pretty much the same every time you do it. Jump and landing, I think we want to try and integrate that as much as we can because it, it's, it's a landing sport. The amount of times you're jumping and landing throughout a game, we, we want to be able to practice that landing components. Obviously trying to do a lot as much work as we can pre, well, pre-injury. So they use the word prehab, but I think strength, pro, strength programs are prehab. If we can make the athlete stronger, we can make them more durable, and if we can get them to control their joints better, that's what's gonna prevent against injury. Then we do a single leg and a hammy, usually you do the hammy across the hip joint, a glute, an ab, a neck, and a stretch for 10 minutes. 90% of the programs that, that are written at Geelong Grammar are gonna follow that, pre, uh, that, um, that template. The neck is one we put in the last, this year we, we've gone heavy on the neck, just going along those lines of just just nice metric holds. Okay, for netballers, soccer players, swimmers, everybody, we, we have a neck at every session, and that's our, probably one of our non-negotiables. Every session we finish with a neck strength, because obviously we're all aware that concussion is really coming in at the moment. But also, we had, I think, six non, what would you say, non-contact concussions last year across our soccer players. I think mostly our female soccer teams we're getting concussion from hitting a wet ball or from falling over and landing, hitting their head. So that means we've got six young girls who are not allowed to play soccer for two weeks. It's, I think it's a mandatory standing out for two weeks at, um, at APS level. But also then that's gonna affect their studies, their schooling, how they're feeling socially, their mental well-being. Anytime a person's injured, they're probably not feeling great because they're not being able to do what they wanna do, which is go out and play with their friends, run around, kick a footy, soccer ball, go for a swim, etc. So the more time we can spend reducing concussion, uh, the better we are. And in that unlikeliness or in the, not unlikeliness, if we happen to get a real bad one, if we can help reduce any risk around the neck um, for a serious neck injury, that's gonna really be beneficial for that student or for that athlete. So if you're not doing neck stuff, um, look into it and, and find something that works well for you. But at the moment, we just do five, 10 seconds each side, trying to keep our neck nice and straight. Sides, front, and back. And we start them out really light. Okay, so they start really trying to push as hard as they can, and as with anything, um, if you haven't done an RDL or a squat for forever, then you start, try and go heavy and hard first up, you're gonna be sore for days. Same with the neck. Okay, so we just try and get that nice and easy to start in with it. And if we're progressing with our rugby teams or our senior football teams, we may start working with a partner. But then making sure that we're pretty serious about not stuffing around sometimes you'll get kids, boys working together and they push as hard as they can on the neck. We want to make it tough, we want to make it controlled and we want to make sure it's, a, it's, it's best for them. Um, in a sports setting, when I was working with the Reds, I always added 
horizontal and vertical power. So we had our, ver our horizontal power would be a, a 10 meter sled. We'd go through timing gates. It was probably either 20 kilos, three by weighted 20 kilo sleds for our forwards, 15 kilos for our backs. We we'd time that and we'd have two by unweighted, two by three 10 meter sprints. We just timed that weekly. That gave us an update. How are athletes traveling? Later on in the week, we'd add a vertical jump as well. Okay, so we're just sort of testing every week, but it's more of a monitoring tool to see how that athlete's going. Do be careful with that. If you're gonna test stuff during the season, because if you get a, a coach who comes in and they may not be um, as educated about it as you like, if you start showing your 10 meter, sleds time, 10 meter sled times are decreasing throughout the season, or your vertical jump height is decreasing throughout the season, that's gonna start raising questions. But if you're using it as a tool to just track how they're going, you might see two or three weeks where they're going down, then they might get a real fresh week where they, they get a real good score. That's great, it's just a monitor of fatigue. Um, and this is our current football program. Seated front squat, trap bar deadlift, or sorry, squat, front squat, or trap bar deadlift. Just a compound leg. If we need to, we'll go to a leg press, try and stay away from it unless there's a specific reason for that. At the moment, we're doing a seated single leg box jump with a single leg land. Now this is almost coming back to the ACL stuff as well. It's a way of getting a landing in, um, but also it's a way of educating our athletes of our young guys about, uh, about the program we're trying to deliver. So if we just go off a single leg, they just stand here, box probably a fraction high, depending on the age you're working with. It's just a sitting down nice and straight. Hold that leg. So they'll do right leg, then they'll go left leg. Obviously you try and jump as high as they can. But then you can ask your athlete, how's it feel? They go, oh, right leg feels great. Feel powerful, feel really strong. How's your left leg feel? Oh, I'm not getting much out of it. Feels really slow, really weak. I can't really accelerate off, that's too low. So then that's highlighting any imbalances they may have. Because you'll find, as, um, as Dan was saying earlier, a right footer is gonna spend most of their time on that left leg. So they have to be able to control that left leg while their right leg's in the air, unloaded. So we'll have a lot of our guys too will run, they'll jump off their left leg, excellent running vertical jump. Then you ask them to do off the right leg, we've got still got some guys who can't do it because they spend so much time running off their left leg, get to the right leg, they don't have that motor pattern, that skill set. So what we're trying to do there is, one, we're trying to work on the landing, every time they must stick to land, but also we're trying to highlight any imbalances between right leg, left leg, power output and landing. Because the draft camp now has a right and left leg running jump, so they're gonna test it. So they're gonna test at draft camp, we wanna prepare our guys to make sure they go well. At the moment we're using a Bulgarian split squat, which have back foot elevated. RDL is a, is a staple in almost all our programs. We're always trying to get that RDL in and really highlighting around the form and how they do it correctly and how we're hinging. Um, and highlighting the fact that it's not like a bench press where you might try and really churn out that last rep. Our RDL is going for feel only. Okay, we're just trying to feel that stretch, control stability around the hip joint and also around the knee joint, have a slight bend in the leg. We do a glute bridge with our band, which is just lying on our back, hips up, pulling our knees out against those tight Australian barbell heavy bands. We found that's been really good to get a bit more strength in our glute abduction. Okay, and then, but also now we're finding that if we do a heap of glute, glute med work, you still have to do some adductor work as well. So that glute med gets really tight. Sometimes those uh, adductors are gonna get a little bit stressed because we're, we're constantly pulling out. Um, our ab is usually a hollow hold or pallov press. Um, and then we also have the isometric neck strength, which I've, I've put there at the end. Up our, our combo day. So what our football program run through is, um, a lower body day on a Tuesday morning. Okay, so we try and get that lower body day in as early in the week as we can, and that's a, it's a non-negotiable. Um, however, most of the time it is negotiated that all those don't turn up. But we'll probably get, out of our senior squad, we'll get 15 guys come in on a Tuesday morning to do, to do the, um, the lower body day. And we'll get everyone in out of our 10 drafter, our 10 scholars, that's ranging from year 10 to year 12, 95% of them will get that lower body day in on a, on a Monday or Tuesday, depending on how they feel. And, and the advice we give them is, you come in and you do it almost no matter what. Um, obviously they'll come and have a chat to you if they're feeling really sore, but 
If you're feeling sore, get in and just get it done. You might only lift at 70 or 80%, get the movements, get the range, get the body used to build that durability in the body, build that resilience. The days you're feeling good, come in and chase it. So if you come in and you're feeling really good for whatever reason, it was a dry day, you didn't get much game time, or whatever it may be, you come in and chase it on the days you feel good. Days you're feeling a bit sluggish, just get in and get it done. Still go through the movements, because we still want to have that body available, be prepared when you are feeling good next week. If we don't do it for two or three weeks because they're sore, then they feel really good, come in and chase the, chase the load, they're going to be sore, miss a few days training, or not be at their best by the weekend. And the earlier we can get it on, get it in the week, the better, because then it allows more recovery for the, for the game bound Saturday. Our upper body days, allow a fair bit of, we give them a program, but allow a fair bit of leniency or, or fair bit of input from the athlete what they want to do. Again, we've got 16 to 18 year old young boys predominantly in the football program. We tell them, I want you to get a horizontal push, horizontal pull. Predominantly, that's always a bench press and a bench pull but they might change it to a dumbbell bench press or a, some sort of bent over row, something along those lines. But they can have a bit more ownership on their upper body program. If we invest in them with education, then when they do get to this stage, they can say, well, I'm feeling a bit sore, I wanna do this, I wanna try this, or what do you think I can do here? So then they're buying into their program. If we do a horizontal push-pull to start, or then do a vertical push-pull second, these can always flip around. And then we'll do a tri-set, Usually a push, pull, push at the end. Arms and abs might give them seven minutes. Okay, generally have a time frame on arms and abs. Otherwise they can be there for, for a fair period of time. But so if you want to get them in, you can get them in. You got, if it's arms, you got five minutes, go. And then we're going to a stretch. And, and abs is the same. We'll generally have a, we try and shape them towards the abs we want them to do. Whether it's a pallet of press, um, hollow hold, um, possibly some rotational stuff. but we try and guide them there. In terms of sets and reps, I've got five by three to five for our first one, or six to eight. I think the easiest way to track is, as opposed to, we might go 80% by five week one, 83% uh, by four week two, 86% by three week four. It's hard to get that nice and specific, especially in our young athletes. So that periodized programming, whereas if we go five by three to five, I say, I want you to get five sets of five, and I'll start that at 80%. If you're a 100 kilo bench presser, give me five fives at 80 kilos. Once they get five fives, then they can go up a weight next week to 82 and a half kilos. Then they might go five, 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 four, four. Great, stay there at that weight. Next week, five, 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 four. Good, stay at that same weight. Once they get a five fives, then they can then progress up to the next load. It gives you that sort of undulating periodization anyway, because the total volume lifted is gonna differ from week to week. If you get one extra rip, one extra rep, sorry, that's gonna give you an extra 80 kilos, so you can actually progress in your total tonnage anyway. Um, and then on days they don't feel great, you're 80% out the window anyway. If you've got a set, set weight prescribed, and you, you're asking them to come in and squat at, uh, at 85%, but they're not feeling good, they're way under that, then they start getting a bit mentally fragile too, oh, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. Um, that can then have them ask, raising questions about, geez, am I progressing the way I should be? Our compound day, we do a, um, or our, our combo day, compound leg, vertical jump. I like to try and test that vertical jump, just to see where they're at. Okay, it gives you an indicator it. on a Thursday, this is typically on, we might go, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, your upper day might be on a Monday, depending on how they're feeling and how their week's structured. Jump in on a Thursday, just sort of says, well, how are they going? If their vertical jumps three or four centimetres down, do we need to do any extra recovery? Do we need to do anything else to, to get you up for this weekend? Or how's your week been? How's your recovery post last weekend's game? How's your food been? How's your intake? What was your sleep like, etc. So if we can start ingraining in them that feedback of they have ownership of their own program, and if they understand why they're doing things and how it's making them better, I think then you're going to get better input out of your athletes. Um, gluten and neck. And they're pretty, again, pretty variable on sets, reps. Give a little bit of leeway. So if you're feeling really good, chase it. If you're feeling a bit sore, still get your leg strength in and your vertical jump in, but still get that movement. Um, but again, give them a little bit of buy-in around where they are. And you'll find, or I find on that Thursday session, they come in at lunchtime. It's a smaller group. It's not as busy. Um, 
they generally come up and say good day to me before they start and we can, we can go through their program, what they're planning on doing. Uh, we'll play this video. I think this is, this is great. There's a lot of real good stuff coming out of GWS. This is from Alex Natera. Um, maybe Todd, who's in the back there, maybe he put me onto this or one of the other guys. This stuff's fantastic. They're working on angles, plyos. Lockie Penfold did a lot of stuff coming out of there as well. Some really sharp stuff. I'm not on Twitter, so um, I generally get this stuff from from the guys who work uh, work with me. But this isn't where we're at. I think all this stuff that we see on, a lot of the stuff that's available, available on social media, that's not us. I think we're developing the athlete first, making them strong through range, making sure they can squat well, hinge well, single leg lunge, single leg move, land. If we can get them doing that well, somebody else does this stuff. But this isn't, this is probably a bit I want to highlight, this isn't where we should be. Um, I think we should be preparing our athletes to send them off to a coach, they can start doing this stuff. Okay, if we're investing our time here, um, I think we can invest our time better. Probably for the, the small amount of time we do have, because uh, from my understanding in the TAC Cup system, you might only get your strength programs for half an hour, a couple of nights a week. And then the, the strength coach wants their role, the physio wants their time. The coaches may want to pick up players throughout that session before training to, to talk about a few things. So time is a premium. We're to look about what are we adding or how are we making our program better in the time that we have. Um, and that's where I think we've got to coach structural integrity and coach a solid base. If you can get them holding that, that nice linear position, okay, with our knee, resisting that valgus force, which we spoke about earlier with the ACL, ACL stuff, if we can be in a nice position here, we can then transfer force laterally, forward, we can jump, we can, e we can eccentrically absorb. Um, and I think that's where most of our athletes, if you look at them, if it, when they land, we can have that hip hinge out, the valgus force comes in. We can't transfer power from here. We need to be able to have that nice strong base to then transfer off and transfer our power. What I talk about often with our, um, our grammys, I have a broomstick and I drop that broomstick on the ground. And because of the solid structure, the broomstick will then bounce and you get a clear bounce out of it. And I ask me, if you cut that broomstick in half and put a spring in, and then drop it, what's going to happen? Just topples over, doesn't it? So even though you've got a spring in the middle of that broomstick, the force doesn't transfer down and up, the force transfers down, comes back up to where that spring is, dongles over, falls. And I think that's our glutes, that's our hips. If we get that position, we can't transfer force, we're seeping energy. And you might have a guy who's fast, he might be slow, but we can make a slow person with bad with poor structural integrity that little bit faster by utilizing 100% of their available speed or their available power. So if we can hold that nice strong position and utilize 100% of that force, we're gonna maximize their speed. Probably can't make them quick, but we can make them quicker or more, more agile. And you often see our shorter athletes, especially in junior sports, the shorter athletes, they're more agile because they can control that shorter lever length. So they're stronger per, lever length ratio, so then they can transfer. Your tall kid, who's probably grown, their bone length has grown really quickly, so their muscular strength can't catch up or can't maintain with it, they, they hip hinge out and they, they collapse. You often see it, especially with young girls in netball who grow really quickly, they don't go through that, they don't have the same hormonal profile to get that muscular strength up as quickly as some of the boys do who then mature a little bit later, but you can have a girl who's well over six foot, and she might be 13, but then her strength, her testosterone levels aren't the same as a boy's would be. So she's growing quicker, but her muscular strength hasn't adapted to those lever lengths as fast. So you get a lot of that hinge hip, you get valgus force come in, and we said it was six times more likely for young girls to have an ACL than for young boys. And we've got half a dozen at Echelon, at Grandma. Um, and they're just educating them around it too. Uh, this, is the, this is the broomstick analogy. You can't shoot a cannon from a rowboat. You must have a strong foundation before you can exert force. So that, that's, our, that's our role, I think, in junior coaches, is creating a strong foundation to be able to exert force, exert power. Because as soon as there's an unstable surface, you're standing on a skateboard and you push somebody, you go back. 
because you don't have a nice strong plantation or strong base support to push from. If you get that nice strong strength position, you exert force, that's when you can exert it and transfer through the opponent as opposed to coming out of you, whether it's through upper body or through hip hinging. Yeah, mate. Um, training outcomes. How are we looking for time? I didn't, yeah, doing really well. didn't start. Yeah, beautiful. Yep. Um, any questions so far on any of this? Just from a stretching perspective, is yep. there any particular type of stretching you do in that 10 minute period? Yeah. We, there is, it predominantly came from our rowing program because we were getting a lot of lower back issues um, for a couple of reasons. One, we had new rowing coaches come in and the program was really trying to develop that program and move it forward because um, the rowing in the APS schools is, a, is probably our predominant sport and that's probably our number one flagship area, I suppose. So we found with the increased rowing volume and the increased strength and conditioning, we were getting lower backs and they were dropping like flies. You then got to ask yourself, is it genuine lower back issues or is it rowing's an extremely hard sport? Is it some people who are, once it starts catching on, if you have a lower back issue, you don't have to do the amount of training. Maybe that's going to be a case too, but we just found that we do a heap of glute stuff, heap of hip flexor stuff, a heap of psoas. Um, and we, we went with a, a reference stretch for our hamstring. So we just got everyone in the habit just going, where are you with your, having your own reference stretch? Very simple, very quick, time efficient. Touching the ground. <sighs> yep, so I know. That's about where I'm at. Cold, if I stretch, go pretty well, I may get a little bit further down. But I know there I'm reasonably well, I can go on and train. If I then go on and, and wake up and I'm here, and then if I go and try and exert force through a structure that's not in you know, its optimal angles or it's not optimally prepared, it's gonna lead to injuries. So in answering your question, we, we finished up almost on a rotation. We just made sure everyone did it. Okay, half start over, oh, we swept in baby groups of four. We have a hamstring group, we'd have a glute group, we'd have a probably hip flexor group. Um, and we might also, and then we'd also finish at the end with a whatever you need group. And we try and educate as often as they can, whether it was around shoulders or backs or calves or hammies. But, um, we tried it initially of, okay, stay behind, have a stretch just as you go, but it, people weren't adhering to it. Whereas now we say right at the end, we start at 6.30, we're finished at 7.40, uh, 7.15. Generally our, our weights will finish at 7.05. We say, right, you've got 10 minutes, we're here till 7.15, then off to brekkie. And making as structured as we can. Um, just with, with, with their loads, are you prescribing their loads and giving them a rep range? To, is that the... Yeah, so we, we look at Generally with our lower body stuff, we're looking at eight to tens, eight to tw generally say eight to 12. So I want you to work with, give me, aim for 10 reps. If you're getting eight, under eight, it's too heavy. If you're getting over 12, it's too light. Um, and I generally, depending on the athletes, say leave anywhere between you know, three and five in the tank. Um, now that, they'll all have a card and they're meant to write out their card each week. Yeah. I, did a, I did 60 kilos by eight reps or by 10 reps. We, we keep a loose eye on that, but they don't always, they don't always fill it out as specific, as particular as we'd want. But then also, if someone's doing 60 kilos and there's four people in the group, one guy's doing eight reps, one guy's doing 12 reps, we're not too concerned because what we're trying to achieve is just to groove that motor pattern. So I think over time, if we can get you know, 40 or 50 reps, or 50 reps a week of squatting in, then when they do get to another club, or they do go to, on to, to be a better, uh, to more professional setup, they're great squatters. If 40 weeks of the year, we can get them doing 50 squats. There's 2,000, does that sound right? 2,000 squats a year over three years. So they should be pretty proficient squatters because form will break down under load. So if we're trying to load a, a motor pattern that isn't grooved or it isn't fully functioning, then that's when injuries are going to occur, especially when they get to a, another level where they're trying to press. So if you've got a rookie come into a, an AFL program, if they can come in and squat well, and squat efficiently, their numbers will go up pretty quick just by having expert coaches in an environment where they are trying to chase those numbers and trying to get stronger. But pre predominantly we say work in the eight to 12 rep range, um, tens where we're after. If you get 12 or eight, that's okay. Um, and then we try and progress the load up as we go. With our scholars, we have, as I said, we had 10 guys ranging from year 10 to year 12. We're a bit more 
specific on what we ask them to do, and but it's more just chatting because there's only ten of them. We can talk to them how you're feeling, how you're going, um, but always try and get that squat through range. So I think the number one or a, a great reflection on your coaching is if you send a person off to a club and they go, oh, he was great. He was really well prepared. They could squat well. They could lunge well. There was no real deficiencies. It just our strength coach would go straight in there and work with them straight away. The functional motor screen doesn't pick up too much. Um, and that's basically what we're trying to achieve with our weights programs. We want to strengthen the body through range, allowing it to maintain structural and biomechanical alignment under load. Okay, as soon as we get out of that biomechanical angles or range, we know we should be here. So then I can transfer force as I need to because I've got that nice strong base, everything's in alignment, everything's maintaining the joints as I need, I can then transfer off as we go. As soon as we have a breakdown around that biomechanical or structural integrity, something is having to load up greater or something's having to use more of a load than it's supposed to, we're gonna, not only are we gonna be producing less force, less efficiently, so that leads to more fatigue, but we're also being vulnerable to injury because we're in a poor biomechanical situation. So getting back to, that is just a simple weights program. You know, what, what I started earlier, squat, jump land, hammy, single leg, maybe some glutes. Like it's pretty simplistic. If you can get your athletes doing that well over a period of time, then they should be really good at it. It requires less amount of coaching too as you go. If you teach someone really well from the start, you start honing in on it. And if there's a group of four on a squat rack, you're educating all four. You might be talking about the guy who's squatting or the girl who's squatting, but the other three who are standing around, they're a part of it too. They should be looking down. Where do you look first, guys? Okay, I'm looking at their heels. What are their heels? When they're coming up, they're coming back, knees coming in. So you're almost giving those cues to every person in that group so that they're going to be help coaching as well. The more eyes you've got, the better. Um, Can I just ask you on that? So what cues do you give them for a squat? I look, I just go look at, my first movement is, <clears throat> and it's actually a really good point because working with elite athlete, working professional sport, you just go, oh, mate, give me an RDL, for example. Just, just do this and it's easy, they do it. Or just go, okay, just stick your bum back and squat down. When you're working with junior athletes or even with junior, just young adolescents who want to come in and, and train, you can give them those cues and they look at you blankly. So. For me, I just sort of say, point your toes out a little bit, nice and relaxed. I find if you point your, your toes out, as long as your knees are tracking over your toes, it opens up your hip, hips a little bit, so you can actually sit down in that squat a little bit better. I'd say just sit here nice and tight through the back. First movement, I want to stick in the bum back, because we still find with our with adolescent athletes, they're very quad dominant, very rarely to have great glutes. So their movement is almost always knees forward, and they're squatting, heels come up. So I just tell them, find an area that's nice and relaxed for you. First movement is hips go back, okay? And then just squat down, keep your knees out. Um, and for the other people in their group, what you'll find is I can go around and just say, okay, how do they look? And they go, oh, you're good. So where are you looking? A lot of the time they're not quite sure. So I just look at their heels. So as soon as I start and those, those heels come up, I know it's probably breaking at the knees first, so their knees are coming forward because they're a quad dominant squatter. And I'm finding, especially in females as well, very quad dominant. One of our staff members recently added in the, the goblet squat. So it's sensational. So they can really hold up nice and tight with a kettlebell or a dumbbell, and it really forces them to, to sit back nicely. The front squat's the same. Um, but again, that was, I took the goblet squat out at some stage out of my programming for no particular reason, and then just never brought it back. Um, and it's great having some young coaches involved who can ask those questions and, and you know, add that to the program. But so you've never put anything under their forefoot? I don't, no. Um, I don't, I think there's, there's varying yeah. opinions out there. And that's what's great to talk to if, you, if you've got involved with any physios at your club or anyone else involved, ask their opinion because you want to be collaborative between the S&C and the physios. It should be, you should be really tight knit because it, it could be just a, a simple knee to wall range. But also I think if you're sitting back, like there shouldn't be a lot of restriction through that range. Um, I think it's only if your knees are coming forward initially, which brings the heels up because the glutes are probably weak, that's why those heels are coming off the ground. 
But um, again, it's got to work out what's best in your situation. And also who your athlete is, and then is it a one percenter or a 10 percenter? So if your athlete's like, oh, I want to do this, someone told me this, yeah, if it's not really going to change the outcome in the short term, that's okay. I'd be progressively trying to lean them back without squatting with something under their feet, but yeah, what works best for your athlete? Yeah, mate? Just with your first developing athletes, have you got a range of strength measures that you'll roll out? Push-ups to failure, or chance to failure. Yeah. What assessments do you typically have? And, and do, you do, do you roll that out amongst all your sports, or are you sport-specific? Yep. Um, again, it's, it's a good question, because Al, the, the long-term athletic development's a term that's, that's really thrown around quite a bit, and it's, it's a very important area, working with junior athletes. I've found that if you have, if I go down that model, which I have used before, um, with the about 2000 and, 11, I suppose, we had the work with the Australian academies for rugby union. Um, working with guys, you think, oh, you've got to be able to do this before you progress to this level, and we want to be able to do a, you know, a mid-thigh hand clean before we go to full hand clean, etc. Um, but I found you've got people over there, you've got this person in this group doing this, this person over here. They feel a little bit segregated, um, whereas if we can go from a, from a push-up point of view, a chest point of view, Hopefully, if they can bench press the bar nice and controlled, well, it's probably not different to benching 60 kilos. So we just, I'll try and keep them all doing a very similar program. It may change slightly on what they're doing with, um, with their leg strength, say. If I, they're not quite up to squatting, I'll, I'll goblet squat them. Um, so I got a bit off track of what you asked there, but... Strength assessments? No. No, no I don't. Short answer just, is... Purely just looking at their program progression, that's how you... Yep. Right. So yeah, purely saying, we're all doing this, there may be some slight tweaks throughout the group. So, okay, you're not quite up to this stage yet. We're doing this, but predominantly it's just do it lighter. And we'll probably try and coach that person through a little bit because we want to get some integrated into the group as well. Um, and depending on how many we've got in the gym, in the mornings we might have uh, 50 to 70 kids in the gym on a busy morning. Um, and there'll be myself and maybe an intern or if we're lucky, maybe another staff member involved in it. Um, so it's quite busy, but if we can just get everyone doing the same program and keeping your eyes on those who we know are a little bit vulnerable I think that's the easiest way to do it. Matt, what about age group um, in terms of your school got young kids as well in terms of their preferency stuff? Yep. Prior, yeah, so we have um, year 10, 11, 12. At year nine, we have timber top. So we have our, our students go up to up the back of Mansfield somewhere um, and they end up running a 33 kilometre, they call it a marathon. But they start out in year nine. There's no social media. They're basically camping out in the woods for, for 12 months. Um, and they live in dorms. So we, we miss them in that year nine year. But then we also find there's a huge amount of ACLs up there in that year because they're doing, they're marching with packs on an unstable ground. They do a heap of stuff around running. So they might start out week one doing 2K runs. By week 40, they're doing a, a 33K Tim Top Marathon. And everyone does it. So that's the what they do up there, but there's no real strength basis behind that. And also we're finding a lot of the year, again, girls particularly, are coming back with ACLs, some amount of skiing they're doing. So what we'd like to do is integrate just a, a simple strength program up there so that they can, you know, again, body weight squat, lunge, jump and land, and, and a hinge with a hammy. We just, we've started using a waiter's bow, um, just holding the bar, a plate in nice and tight, and that's your RDL. Getting back to almost your point earlier about how do you coach these things, um, because we're having a huge amount of problems with people not being able to do an RDL that hinge properly. But if we could get that in up there, I think that'd be a great benefit. And I think that will come over a period of time. However, timber top's been going for 40 or 50 years. It's just integrating those things in there. But um, come year 10, we try and get everyone to come in in their PE classes early. So they come in, they get integrated into the gym, they get a bit of instruction, they feel welcome. And then once they're in, we can start shaping them how we, we want to get them moving. A lot of times it's here, just come in, we've got a base template, let's go through a leg press. We have a leg extension, hammy curl. You know, it's a pretty basic machine related program. Once they've gone through that card, it might be six to 10 times, as they come back and see us and then we'll start you know, teaching them how to goblet squat and, and lunge, et cetera, a bit more free weights. But, I think we um, we do miss out on that year nine, year nine level. Oh, 
Five minutes, yep. We'll go, uh, is that another question? Next slide, mate. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a concentration. Okay, it, it's, you are gonna be limited to your amount of time you have, so you might have half an hour for a weights program. You wanna get the most bang for your buck early as you can, because if we spend 30 minutes going through prehab, rehab, jump, land, stretch, warm up protocols, by the time we get to our squatting, which is our, our heaviest movement, probably our, where we need the most concentration, they're about done, okay? Because mentally, they're starting to frazzle, they're starting to chat, look around the room. Teenage boys particularly, um, concentration levels aren't always great. So I look at what's the most important aspect of your training program, how do you want it done, and put that first. The prehab, rehab, the landing, the stretching, the, um, the proper warm-ups, etc., are excellent, and they need to be done. But also you can try and prioritise how much that you do before you get to the, the bread and butter of your program, which is your, is your strength training. So is your warm-up process helping or hindering your outcomes? A half an hour warm-up, by the time you get into your program, you might be getting anything out of your program. Um, and create an environment that is conducive to improving. And does your coaching method allow this? Okay, this is another thing I've, I've found with, with adolescents. You have to really engage them and have them give them a buy-in. Because if they don't believe what they're doing, if they don't feel part of it, it can quite easily just shut you out. Okay, you think even though you're very experienced in the program you're running and you're very experienced in what you do, they've seen another guy do it somewhere on the internet, well, I'll, I'll take that guy because he's on the internet. So you've got to make sure you build that trust and that relationship so that they're asking you questions. If they're not asking you questions, that's, that's a time of concern. If they are asking you questions, that's good because it means they trust your opinion. Um, we always go on a set time. So at Grammar, we have our programs. So we'll squat and a single leg jump squat on the two and a half, two, two and a half, depending on, on how our day is looking. So I'll be yelling out, first set, go. We'll get them going through. Once we start our second set, right, our second set, go. It's pretty structured. Um, buy in intrinsic rather than extrinsic motivation. Again, we've discussed it. They have to, or well, I believe they have to feel a part of the program and the process, and they need to be, um, I, they need to feel a part of it. If you can make sure they're involved in the training programs, what they're doing, I think you're gonna get a much better outcome. Because at the end of the day, we, we want them to be better. And we want them to be educated so that when we send them on to other programs, whether it's AFL programs, whether it's the AFL Academy programs, whether it's at your TAC Cup programs, I want them to have a reason why they're doing things and ask questions so that when they do ask you questions, you'll then give them a good answer. They trust in what you're saying them and also they're, they're broadening the way they do things. Because so we've got them for one or two hours a week. Yeah, it's what they're doing in those other hours. I think 1440 was Vern Gambetta's thing. It's 1440 minutes in every week. And that's just stuck with me. Next one, please, mate. Um, <coughs> and know your role. You get to go to an AFL club, you get a track suit, you get gear. I'm still wearing the pants I got from Queensland Reds. Then my go-to pants and suits. What is your role and why are you doing the role you're doing? It has to be to improve your athletes. If you're doing this role to then get on to, and everyone should have ambitions to go on and be a, a coach at the highest level that you want to achieve or have your ambitions of where you want to go to with your coaching. But first and fundamentally, the process has to be about making your athletes better so they go on and have a better career. And then when somebody does ask about you, if they ask your athletes and they give you a glowing report and they, they speak well of you, that's the best endorsement you can get. As opposed to, I think, there's a lot of stuff out now, especially on social media about people putting fancy things on and doing all this stuff about uh, advanced training methods. I think that's, you know, you're doing that for yourself or for your athletes. So that's a pretty important question to ask. What's your role? What's your purpose in regards to doing it? Um, and know what you're trying to achieve. I think this is a big one. Every session must have a purpose. Yeah, what are you trying to achieve out of that session? And you're either adding to fatigue or you're adding to performance. If you're, adding, if you're just adding to fatigue by trying to make your person squat 10 kilos heavier or bench 10 kilos heavier, is that coming at detriment then to the speed coach, to the conditioning coach, to the skills coach? There's only so much pie, a piece of a pie that you can use. If you've got your 20% that you're allowed to use, if you start using 25, that other five has to come from somewhere. So we have to prioritise what you want to do, how you want to do it, to make sure that what you're doing is adding to their performance, not adding to fatigue. An extra half hour in the gym 
maybe some extra half hour they have to come in. Doing recovery on a Sunday, on a Sunday morning down at Williamstown's Beach may be great, but then that half hour recovery turns into a three hour commitment. Getting up, driving there, coming home, having some breakfast, you know, those structured rehab sessions or recovery sessions next day, I think you have to also ask, is this what's best or is it just sleeping in, spending time with a family, girlfriend, partner, whatever it may be, is that gonna be better for your holistic approach? Thanks for your time.